We will move straight into the presentation on the social impact bond in Colombia, which I think was partly the genesis of this day in the first place. So this is, to some extent, the, the core of the day experience. And let me call on Daniel Uribe, who is, uh, let me see, Deputy Director of Fundacion Corona in Colombia, which is a family foundation on the construction empire. Thanks. Daniel. Hello, morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting us here. It's an honor to be representing the Social Impact Bond of Colombia. Uh, in, in Colombia, we believe that the Social Impact Bonds are a public-private partnership that gathers together people to solve co uh, complex problems. Uh, and we're very, very proud to be the first country, middle-income country, to be able to implement these kind of new models and to show that it's replicable and scalable in different kind of regions. We have seen it has been implemented in, in several sectors and workforce development is the one that has been mostly tested. And in Colombia, there is like a big, big problem in unemployability. There is over 3 million young people that are, are, are unemployed and over 3 million victims of the conflict are, are also going through that kind of problems. And for that reason, with the government of Colombia, it has always been a priority to try to change the way we address that problem, not focusing only on training process, but mostly focusing on how to close the skill gap that the companies are requiring with the population and that is vulnerable. Previously, in the previous presentation, we were able to see many of the key advantages of the social impact bonds. But for Colombia, there has been two key challenges and, and drivers to, to implement this kind of model. The first one is that as, as a developing country, we don't have the same kind and amount of information as a developed country. So all, all about focusing on outcomes and monitoring culture and getting the data has been one of the key challenges that we have been living over the last two, three years, and that has inspired the different kind of organizations to get together to work. And the last one, but not least, also very important, is the drive of performance management. There are some good amount of service providers in Colombia that are addressing this employability issue, but none of them has been uh, assessed uh, or assessed uh, in the performance management way, with the rigorosity of the investors and different kind of of approaches to improve every time more and focusing more on outcomes. The Colombian program has a difference than different other projects that the region has been uh, implementing. Why? Because of the support with the IDB, the MIF, and SECO, we developed an, an holistic program that has three components. The first one is that we want to list at least three social impact bonds on the same topic on employability for vulnerable population. That gives us the advance to be able to learn as we go through these stages of different kind of piloting processes and, and give us the possibility to go hand in hand with the government as co-payers, uh, outcome payers with the government through the support of this uh, help of Switzerland government. The second one, as was mentioning before in the previous presentation, it's very important to help the market creation. We have to build the capacity on the different stakeholders, on the evaluation of the service providers, on the regulatory part. But second, as I mentioned before, the data infrastructure, it has to be built. So we're setting up all the data infrastructure together with the government as a partnership to build all the kind of data that is required to assess how we're changing this kind of problem. And we have to build the policies to make it possible. This is quite new. In Colombia, we have gone and we have been working with public-private partnerships in infrastructure over the last years, and the government sees this as a PPP, but for social changes. So it's one of the ways they are addressing this kind of, of situation. And third component is very important, and, and as the previous presentation mentioned, this is quite new movement, and we believe that there is a lot of learnings to be shared between the different actors in, in the developing countries. We have been shared our experience with Mexico, our challenges with Argentina right now that they're also working on employability, social impact bond. So it's an open platform that is public knowledge for everybody to be able to, to share. This is a brief example, sorry, uh, of 
what the social impact bond in Colombia, the first social impact bond, looks like. So we define as the first pilot to focus in mainly vulnerable people and victims from 18 to 40 years old that hasn't got any kind of job and they were not participating in government programs. And the people, it, it, it seems not that big, 514 people, but it's comparable to the kind of social impact bonds in the world that have been working with a workforce development in a stage of one and a half years. So we compare with those kind of social impact bonds. The three outcomes that we defined that were measurable and uh, aligned with incentives of the government were employability, formal employability, that's one of the biggest issues in Colombia, the informality on the labor. Second, the retention at three months, that is, it was starting to be the common goal on government programs, but a new goal of setting like six months retention period. This is quite new. This is the first time that the government is measuring such a, well, it's longer period of time that measures the quality of the kind of the employability that the people are getting. So these are the characteristics. We are also trying it in three different cities that have different kind of environment and, and context issues. So we're working in Bogota, the capital of Colombia, that has, well, a lot of employ unemployability issues, but we're also work working in Cali with a different kind of context and in a smaller city that's called Pereira. So we are able to learn from different kind of contexts to see if that influence on the results and also learnings of this kind of pilot. Who are the stakeholders on how did we build this partnership? So the outcome payers is it was started from the government. The, 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 the champions on the government has been social prosperity department, the ones that Later on the panel, you will learn a little bit more about this institution and the support of the IDB MIF through SECO as co-payers to be able to de-risk the involvement of the government in these first shifts. As investors, we have three foundations, Fundación Corona, the, the one I represent, Fundación Mario Santo Domingo, and Fundación Bolivar da Vivienda. It's very important, even though the three foundations are investors, we're investing from our endowment money. So we're mission-related investments. It's not philanthropic money that we will invest in different kind of projects, but we're actually taking out money of our endowments to put it as a new mission-related investment as impact investors. We have been playing the role as intermediary because Fundación Corona has been working in labor inclusion over the last five years and we have set up a different kind of models of intervention that can support the different stakeholders during the program. But we didn't have the experience on the financial part. So for us, it was very, very important to make a partnership with Inversor. Inversor is the performance manager and also like the investment administrator that is the first impact investment fund develop in Colombia. So they help us build the SPV, the financial vehicle, the way we have to treat the investors because we didn't have any experience in that topic. So trying to develop the market in that sense. In our case, we were trying to see who could be a good service provider. When we were learning in different SIPs in, around the world, there's usually one good service provider. But in Colombia, there, is, there are none many service providers that have been evaluated and tested with you know, real assessments on impact. So we make an open call and invite four different service providers that have good experience but not evaluated methodologies. The good part of this one is that two of those is the first time that they're working with the government program. So they were having an entry into the market of new service providers to develop the market as well. On the evaluation process, it was very challenging for us because who knew about measure social impact bonds in a country that has never been developed? So we believe that it was very important, the trust that was just mentioned, to gather the AAA uh, intermediary or uh, verification and evaluation firms. And Deloitte had some experience in social impact bonds and had the trust from the different stakeholders to be able to learn within the process how to measure through administrative data all the um, employability that we were gathering and achieving during the project. The technical assistance is one of the most important parts to be able to develop and launch a social impact bond. We had the fortune to work with Instiglio that has been in Colombia over the last six years and were the ones that bring the social impact bond methodology and concept to Colombia six years ago. So they were helping us designing the methodology and the technical assistance. We're working with Pro Bono Foundation, that's the legal joint firms that helps, and the legal structure is one of our key challenges that we have learned. And Fundación eh, Compartamos con Colombia is a consultancy firm that helps us make the due diligence to select the service providers that we achieve. This is just a different way to show how it was structured more and more. So probably it's a little complex, but the first part was that we make an overall agreement of the outcome payers, so they 
selected that they wanted to work in this program for five years, and then they sign with us as intermediary uh, pay for success contract. Once we had that pay for success contract with all the technical stuff that was going and was being desired in this contract, as the investors, we built the fiduciary contract and we put our investments there and we were able to hire the four service providers. The four of them uh, are being paid almost 90% by activities and 10% also taking some risk to start to be result-based financing into the value chain of the program. They were giving the service providers the delivery to the population, and once uh, uh, Deloitte evaluated the results, they were able to pay some of the results. This is a progress so far. We are more or less at the 60% of the program. So far, it's one and a half years. We started in March last year, and we will end at July this year. So far, we have achieved almost 80% of the employability that we were setting up as a goal. And what has been very good for the government and to be able to show is that they have paid almost 64% of their budget on result-based financing. And that has been a change of paradigm for the government to be able to show that it works and it could be efficiency compared to different kind of programs. So, as, as I mentioned before, it's a project or a program that has different kind of components. So that gives us the advantage to be able to learn very or easily or faster. So we're now trying to set up a second impact bond in a, as, at a local level at, in Cali, also on employability. The municipality of Cali has been very interested because they were part of the first SIP and they have learned and they got very enthusiastic about the data infrastructure, the performance management tools, and they would like to be part of it. And because we're changing the government right now, we're also trying to give all the learnings into the next government of the presidency of Colombia that will come for the next four years. So we'll be be able to make some public advocacy through the help of this current government into the next one. So this is more or less where the time frame where we are right now. And well, to share some learning so far, uh, one of the first one is legal structuring. Uh, we, we didn't thought that it was going to be like really hard time on the legal part. We, we, we took the legal part at the middle of the project, you know, the structuring part. And for the next social impact board, we're taking the lawyers from the beginning because it's what we have to change the most within the government institutions to be able to understand how these kind of contracts are changing the business as usual kind of contract that the governments are making. So this is very important. Second, because it's a small scale of social impact bond, we have to figure out the way how to monitor the cost of structuring. So it won't be more costly, the structuring part, than the SIP itself. So we have to monitor not only what you are spending in kind of a consulting firms, but also the time that the people and the teams have spent during this program. Third of all, the performance management tool. We develop a, a specific tool for employability for this program and has been very interesting to see how the government think we, they could use this tool for all their employability programs because it's really interesting the way the um, investors develop new private tools to monitor that kind of investments. And there are other different ones, key learnings that we'll share along during the panel, but one that is very important is the alignment on incentives that was previously mentioned on the panel. So coordination and accountability is the key address and trust to be able to make this kind of project. So I will show you a short video of the kind of population that we're helping to success and to change their, their lives, and then we'll go to the panel. Thank you very much. Mi nombre es Daisy Pineda, tengo 35 años, soy de la localidad de Ciudad Bolívar, soy madre cabeza de hogar, tengo dos hijos, eh, estudio, eh, estoy estudiando acá. Yo soy de Valledupar, Cesar, Ajá. vivo en Suacha, eh, soy desplazada, desplazada de Valledupar porque pues ya resultó un conflicto con, con la guerrilla y los paramilitares y salí desplazada. Que nos están dando la oportunidad de adquirir conocimientos y de aplicar lo que nosotros estamos aprendiendo acá ya en el ámbito laboral. much from them. So, uh, Liliana, I think you're going to run this panel. Yes. 
thank you very much. It was a bit an abrupt, um, and there is a longer version. Um, but we also want to make sure that we have enough time for Q and A and um, and give enough. I have a microphone. Thank you very much. So it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome uh, now my guest from Colombia. Um, I would like to start with my guest on the right, um, Juan Felipe Rodriguez Sanda. Uh, he's the director for management and coordination of the social services in the Department for Social Prosperity. Um, in this position, he promotes, among other public-private partnerships and international relationships uh, to mobilize resources to overcome poverty in Colombia. Social Prosperity is the government entity in charge of social inclusion and reconciliation to overcome poverty and extreme poverty. Over the last 12 years, um, he has worked in different positions in and outside the government, um, among others in the presidency office and at UNICEF. And you have been involved in the design and implementation of over 600 uh, projects of social infrastructure and income generation in rural areas affected by the armed conflicts. Um, Christine Ternant, uh, you're the lead specialist um, in Colombia for the MIF, the Multilateral Investment Fund, which is the innovation lab of the Inter-American Development uh, Bank. And Christine has been at the IDB for 15 years, um, and her areas of expertise include competitiveness, social innovation, high-impact entrepreneurship for vulnerable populations and extraordinary va value firms, and inclusive cities. And lately, she's involved with understanding how to get people, firms, clusters, and governments disruption ready as the world trends begin to affect all aspects of society. Um, Christine has been part of the SIP team in Colombia from the very beginning. On my left, uh, Fernando Cortes uh, is the executive director of the Bolivar de Vivienda Foundation, a corporate foundation of an important financial group in Latin America. He has been involved in creating one of the most relevant high-impact social entrepreneurial programs in Colombia, along with the development of the ecosystem that supports impact investment. He was also a key figure behind the first social investment fund in Colombia, Inversor. In addition, he has been working with the Colombian government to develop an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Maria del Rosario Carvajal is the executive president from the Carvajal Foundation in Colombia, a nonprofit organization created more than 50 years ago with the purpose of improving the quality of life of the most vulnerable communities in the prioritized cities of Cali and Buenaventura. The main focus of your work is on income generation, education and culture, as well as social and community development. And last but not least, uh, Avnish Gungadurdos. Um, you're the co-founder and managing partner of Instilio. Instilio is a leading global advisory firm that works with donors and governments in Latin America and Africa to structure results-based financing instruments that maximize the social impact of public funds. And you have been participating in the structuring of the SIP and also on other um, projects that will be discussed uh, throughout the day. So a warm welcome to all the panelists. And as you see, these are many panelists, but it's about half of the stakeholders we have seen in the introduction by Daniel Uribe. So I would like to start with you, Juan Felipe. Um, this is the first social impact bond in, in a middle-income country. Um, so you're really taking a leadership role. What has prompted the Colombian government to enter this uh, new mechanism? It might be good. Yeah. So thank you, Liliana, for this invitation. Um, please let me um, um, I, I, I want to give the, the audience some background about what we do in social prosperity. Um, social prosperity is the, the agency of the Colombian government that took on this challenge. Um, and uh, is in charge of designing policies and programs to overcome poverty and promote social inclusion 
and pro um, productive, productive inclusion uh, for the most vulnerable, vulnerable population. So one of the most important areas of, of work is employability um, for poor population. Just to give you an order of magnitude between um, 2016 and 2017, more than 12,000 12, people have participated in our workforce development program that we call Jobs for Prosperity. However, this program traditionally contracts service providers to implement job training projects. We typically hire them to execute a list of activities, um, and we pay them once they have finished offering those services. So, so, how, so how, somehow we assume that after the training, people will have access to jobs. But we don't really know if that is true. In this traditionally, traditional approach, the public budget is spent just on training activities. Therefore, the major difference with the social impact bond is that here we focus on pay, paying for outcomes, ensuring poor and vulnerable people get a formal job and keep the job for three and then six months. So when the IDB, MIF, SECO, and the investors who are out here with us today, Fundación Corona, Fundación eh, Mario Santo Domingo, Fundación Bolívar de Vivienda, came to us with uh, this innovative way to pay for outcomes and focus on jobs rather than just on training, we obviously thought it was something worth piloting as a potential effective mechanism and for financing and implementing social programs. We were interested both in better spending of the government budget, but while at the same time reaching the end goal of creating formal jobs for the poor. So we decided to test this new concept as a way to promote social mobility among the poorest and most vulnerable population, including youth women and victims of violence. Um, and in March of last year, after eight months of hard work, we launched the first SIP in a developing country. We were where the government co-pays for results, as, as Daniel mentioned before, uh, together with the IDB MIF and SECO. Um, the, the design phase had both significant, significant achievements and important challenges. So let me first highlight what I think we have achieved. First of all, this project has successfully aligned actors from the public, private, and international cooperation agencies to work together on this innovative model and towards a common goal generating formal income for Colombia's most vulnerable population. Secondly, we are seeing a mind shift in the way government agencies are understanding that they can and should work towards implementing, implementing longer interventions and to achieve more efficient and effective results, and this is really important for us. This changes the way in government plan, but plan, budget, and implement programs moving toward, towards multi-year budgeting instead of trying to contract and execute everything during one fiscal year. It's very hard to get results if you cannot ensure the right length of training, job placement, and job retention. Finally, a great achievement of this project is to have started a creating a, a program, an information system for employability programs that supports better policy making and offer quality, quality inputs for improve the structuring of future employability programs in terms of price, costs, and payment metrics. In Colombia, this is the first time that labor retention is an indicator of an of unemployability programs, and, and the, I, I want to I want to highlight that is it's really important. But we have uh, also important challenges, <laughs> and, and the first uh, challenge we are looking at is how to achieve sustainability of SIPs from one government period to the next. We need to ensure that the SIP model is mainstream into mainstreamed 
into public policy and becomes a more permanent, me permanent mechanism to implement important social programs. The second, which is related, is how to ensure that we can scale the SIP from a small, a small pilot, pilot with limited public resources to a SIP model with sufficient funding to have much broader impact in terms of number of jobs for vulnerable populations. A third challenge is how to implement social programs with budget flexibility to allow the use of multi-year budgets in order to achieve longer intervention for more efficient and effective results. And the final cha challenge I'd like to mention is how to keep building data infrastructure with complete and relevant information for employability programs. We need to be able to, under to understand not only the cost of employing one poor or, or vulnerable person, but also then the savings in public spending in the medium and long term. Thank you very much for sharing um, these experiences and your views, uh, also challenges and, and achievements. Um, working myself in a government entity, I, I, I'm, I'm really impressed and I can only imagine um, you know, how bold one has to be to actually make this change. Um, and I would like to recognize really um, this achievement to focus really on, on outcomes and real results so people are employed and not, not, not just trained. I would like um, to move to the investor side. Um, we have heard um, the, 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 the question of um, return expectations. Um, at, at the same time, we're, we're in a space where the impact is key. Um, how, what, 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 are you, what are you expecting out of this SIP? What are your return expectations? How much were you motivated by the impact you want to see? Um, can you share some insights with us? Sure, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as an investor, uh, we started expecting a 27% rate of return. <laughs> but, but now we're almost getting to 8%. And after Toby's this encouraging comments about <laughs> SIPs, we see it as a very uh, interesting and a w investment that can help not only in, in an employability, but in a lot of different other social issues. And particularly, uh, I think corruption is one of the things that our country and probably most countries around the world face. And social impact bonds are a way to show the government and give the government some sort of trust, our, our funds becoming like a catalyst to improve um, the government's trust in paying for results. So if anything happens, and as Toby was saying that, probably the scalability of most of these SIBs are gonna be low or slow we're probably gonna be seeing that if the government is able to spend at least 1% in outcome-related uh, initiatives, it's gonna be a huge market. So we see it as an investor, and as Daniel was saying prior to the, to his, to the introduction, he said that uh, we as investors need to put our money where our mouth is, and that's why we invested part of our endowment. And as an endowment, we see it that we're going to build that trust in the government, putting forward in what we see as um, as an investment that that's going to be able to uh, build that trust that we need to to build in in the government and in other investors. Uh, what we're trying to build is an asset class. So if we start building this asset class with um, our banks' uh, customers, we're going to start. Uh, getting people involved in solving social issues with very low amounts of money. We don't need institutional investors here. We need people that are able to think, hey, I can invest $100 and help to, to solve a social issue. So building, as investors, building this with Inversor, which is the fund that uh, Daniel was mentioning, we start building an asset class that will probably take a while, but there's no hurry in in in. in solving these social issues. I mean, we've been here forever, 
and a lot of these issues haven't been solved. So building this new asset class is going to be something that's going to be really interesting to build. And additionally to that, we're going to help the government support um, uh, programs that, are, uh, how do you call them? The performance outcomes, uh, outcome-oriented programs, and um, we're going to help the government understand better what they need to know and build the information uh, that, that, uh, that we need, the information about the different social issues so we can uh, spe specify any other program that we need, that we need to be done. So, so I think that uh, for us it was a great experience. It has been a great experience. Uh, we invested our money not to make money but to create that asset class and to prove to the government and support the government Government, because as Toby was also saying, government officials are not very keen of doing these sort of, of of programs because it's it's very risky for them. It's it's something that's new, nobody has done it, so it's it it was it was a huge step for them, and that's something that that um, we wanted the government to to feel supported with with three institutions uh, of investors that are very renowned in in Colombia, and and that makes a lot of sense for. A building trust in government. Thank you very much. Um, you were saying you were not expecting um, any any profit, but it looks quite good according to the results that you will actually get your money back. So we're good. Uh, we're good to know. We good don't start. have a result until this ends. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get we'll get that eight percent. Hopefully we get our money back. But but but. Um, That's the bottom line. Yeah. Yes. But we we're sure that we're gonna make. I mean we've done a great learning experience and, and it has been really interesting for, for all of us. Thank you very much. I would like to go um, to, to Maria del Rosario. As a service provider in, in, in this setup, um, what has changed for you within this mechanism? Thank you for inviting us. There is an honor to be here. It's an honor for a Colombian uh, to be with this group and to share the experiences that we had have with the SIB uh, program. Uh, for us, uh, we have uh, been working with employability programs like since five, six years ago, but this is the first time that we are working with the government. At the beginning, we have another programs that we were we wanted to work with the government, but it was not easy to have the flexibility, as Toby was mentioning, that we are like, um, like an analogy with the bridge. Since we work with the formal sector as well as the informal sector, what we have learned is that we can work like from the last step of the, of the chain. We start working with the companies, with the employers, to motivate them to work with the vulnerable communities. So that what we have uh, learned from this program is that we have to the, go to the companies to show them that this is uh, an uh, interesting business here because they can receive people from the vulnerable communities have, have a, a, and diminish their turnover because we train them and in order to that they remain in the job and they remain in the training programs. So it had changed for us because we have this um, orientation to um, orientation programs that help people to remain in the jobs because when they are in vulnerable communities, they don't have this uh, medium and long-term perspective because they have to satisfy the, um, the basic needs on the day-to-day -day basis. So we have learned a lot working with the government and make it more flexible. Uh, now, as um, Daniel mentioned, uh, we have to have a verification from Deloitte, and sometimes it took a long time. And in those programs, you have to have the response immediately from the, from the operator as well as the, from the companies. So one of the cases that we um, brought to, um, and changed it was that we brought the companies in the first time when we registered the people. So when the people come for registration, they saw that there are companies that they have the possibility of working there. So we have the pre-selection for the training before, and we, we didn't have that opportunity in the other programs. We have the registration and pre-selection at the same time. That's actually a good insight to see how this more flexibility and focus on, on reaching real employability has adapted your, your interventions. 
And another point is that now the government is looking for us for these programs. Since we have shown some results, some very interesting results, we have 50% of the people trained already higher in the companies. And after that they have been employed, we continue giving support because for them it's very difficult to uh, comply with the schedules, with the requirements in the job. So we have to make sure that they are continue working. We have 50% almost working at least three months. Thank you. I would like to go to um, Avnish. Um, you have been um, involved in advising the setup of, uh, of the SIP from a technical perspective. Um, we heard, um, and, and that's usually what many people are interested in, this price setting, right? Um, how did you go about finding the three cats in the black room? Okay. So I'll tell you the magic tricks now. Uh, no, like I think um, this is really sort of a hard question to figure out, right? Uh, and, and it's hard not only because it's a technical challenge, which I think you've alluded to, but it's also a political challenge. Um, and I think it's worth starting with the political nature of this challenge. Um, when you are a government agency and you've been really talking about unit costs for the last decades and for however long it's been, in terms of the number of people you've been reaching and how much it costs to reach somebody, when you're making the transition to talking about how much does it take to impact somebody, it's a huge leap and you're almost kind of changing the scales at which you're talking about. I think uh, it might take maybe $50 to train somebody in these programs, but it's taking maybe $1,000 to actually get them a job. Uh, so I think we need to like really be sensitive to that challenge and uh, to the challenge that governments face in justifying the sleep and actually talking about it, framing it internally. Um, and that political challenge comes with a need for a technical justification as well of why we're making such transitions and pricing in the way we are. Um, and uh, in terms of the technical challenge, I think, of creating that justification, uh, we are, it, ha it has to be sort of clear that we're operating in a very data scarce environment. It's not the case that we have a clear understanding of what, is, what it costs today to produce outcomes of employment or retention, and even less so on six month retention. So we're operating in a space where uh, the government has some data on this, but it's not always very clear uh, how it translates to this particular population. Uh, the service providers have built some data, but it's not always clear if it's comparable. So we went into, I think, a process of triangulation, uh, looking with Foundation Corona at all the different service providers and trying to get data from them on what, it is, what does it cost to produce these outcomes, uh, rebuilding in some ways the database that is needed for these contracts. We did the same thing for the government, uh, looking at the historical pricing, prices that they've been paying, uh, and finally even went to sort of a cost-based approach of building a service and trying to back check that. Uh, and that creates, I think, a range of negotiation that organizations around the table feel comfortable uh, starting to negotiate around. But I think we're all sort of also very conscious that there's uncertainty around this price. It's very, it could be very, very well be the case that the government is currently overpaying. It could be very well be the case that it, they are underpaying and that investors may lose money. Uh, but it is what we can do in this environment of data. And over time, I think uh, the, that's why it's interesting to have the Colombian SIB program where there's a, an intention to replicate the experience and to learn from the first one. And hopefully, through that learning, be able to adjust the pricing over time. Um, and it's also sort of like is important to reflect on the importance to have the kind of partners we have around the table uh, for this kind of innovation, right? Because there's some real risks that are being taken. And I think from Prosperidad Social, the social innovation unit was the one that really championed it because that's the mandate of taking those risks. Uh, and we have foundations who, as uh, uh, Fernando just mentioned, like are very conscious that this is not a mechanism to make money, but to really enable the government to explore this new pay for success mechanism. Uh, so there's uh, some real innovation risks as well involved. Uh, in the process, and we hope to be driving uh, that learning into the next social impact bond that uh, Danielle and Christine are currently uh, championing. Were there some confidentiality issues you were faced when gathering for this data? Yeah, yeah, indeed. I, I think sort of you would expect the typical um, processes to be in place, especially in the government side, in terms of data sharing and conf confidentiality issues. And I think uh, it was quite important for Instiglio to sort of play the honest broker role between the different organizations and gathering the data 
on the invest and service provider side and providing that technical input, but also being able to cut, uh, go across the aisle uh, to the government and uh, do that analysis uh, in person there and bring that input into the conversation as well and provide that range for discussion, right? So that's how we mitigated the confidentiality issues. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that w what it shows is that um, you, you really start to gathering the data, not just on one aspect, but on, on, on an overall process to actually get, get the pl employability. And you may look at how much does it cost if a person is not employable, and then you, you, you start to get the, cost, the real costs, and that, that changes the conversation. Christine, I would like to ask you um, if you could tell us more about the role of, of the MIF and um, the reasons basically for the IDB group to get involved. Thank you, Liliana. Um, first of all, let me thank you and Midos and Lou for putting this together um, here in, in Switzerland and Christian Brandley, Christian Sieber and Catalina Pulido in Colombia. It's been a, an extraordinary partnership uh, to, to know and get to know uh, Seco and come all this way. Uh, I think if, if many of us had thought and if I had heard Toby before uh, getting here, I'm not sure that I would have gotten so involved in this from the beginning. Um, so I come to this I'm very new to this. I, I don't know anything about SIBS. I came here, uh, this is the first time I've been to an international conference on this. And um, the people who actually got the MIF and the IDB involved in this are sitting in this room. Julie Katzman, our executive vice president, and Zach Levy, our my colleague from the MIF until like two weeks ago. He's now a consultant. And, um, and I don't think I would have ever gotten involved in, in this. It's a very, very difficult issue. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of actors to put together. Um, we have probably had, I don't know, maybe three, four, five times that we thought the SIB was not going to fly. Um, uh, but I think in having both Zach and Avnish with us um, and telling us that it was probably going to be possible. Um, we took on the challenge, and today I think that we're, um, we're very happy to have done it. Um, but, but this has been, and, and I think it's important, if people think that this is easy, you're wrong. It's not. If you think that it's um, not scary, you're wrong. It is. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that's why we're here. Uh, why is the MIF and why is the IDB part of this? Because we do take on challenges and we take on innovation so that we can show the countries that we work in um, that it is possible. And when we're there, somehow uh, we give some confidence and some trust to people that we're there not only with our money, uh, we're also there with our work and uh, side by side with all of the people who are sitting here today. Um, I am a native Colombian and therefore I can tell you that we are as proud as you can imagine uh, in being the first SIB in a developing country. Uh, many people know Colombia from before, a very bad reputation that we have had. We are today in a middle income country, and I think that we are now moving out of very difficult situation from before, and being here with you all um, talking about a SIB early, very early on. This is, uh, you know, we've, we've just started. Um, so we have a lot of information on a lot of challenges we had, um, and we're starting to evaluate what the returns are going to be for the investors, what the returns are going to be for the government, what the returns are going to be for us, what are the returns for the, uh, inv the uh, service providers. And I think from what you can see here, we have a great team. I don't think we could have done this if this gr group and many others who are in the audience and in Colombia had not come together to do this. Um, I think our role has been as, first, we designed the overall project. project. We um, are co-payers with the government, uh, with SECO funds for the SIBs, the three SIBs that are going to be um, launched. We have one, the second one is coming up, and the third will be afterwards. Um, we are co-funders and supervise components two and three, which Daniel spoke about, and I'll uh, have an opportunity of talking about a little bit further on. And we gave technical advice when it was, uh, when it was needed, um, and an international network that brought together Insiglio and many others that have helped us with this. Um, I think one of the most important things here too is I am not an expert either on uh, employability programs, and we got to work with our IDB counterpart in Colombia on labor markets, and she brought to this an enormous amount of technical expertise that was very helpful. So I think that in general, we've, we've just kind of been playing the role that 
was needed to be played. We've evolved in the role. As people need us to do different things, we've moved into different roles. And, and right now, I can only say that it has been um, quite an adventure. I, I can concur with everything you've said, and especially also with the last um, statement. No, thank you very much. And I think um, what you've mentioned also, the collaboration within the IDB group is also a very important uh, point from an institutional point of view, that you can tap cross-institution-wise uh, in, into relevant expertise and make this expertise available uh, for this kind of interventions. I would like to come back uh, to you, Maria uh, del Rosario, on, um, on, on, on your role. Um, we've heard uh, investors have expectations. You, you will be also paid according to performance. How much have you and your staff been under pressure you know, to really reach these results? And sometimes we hear about SIPs that there is a risk of creaming so that you 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 um, go only about the least uh, um, difficult cases how ha has this been um, a challenge for you if you could elaborate on that it's a very interesting question since the foundation has been working for more than 50 years in the most vulnerable communities uh, this program is it really has been a challenge because uh, we have to have uh, results for the employers as, for, as well as for the government. But we have been working with population with 89% women, 38% uh, Afro-descendants. So, so we are working with the poorest of the poor. And it has been very interesting to see how they are retaining in the uh, training process as well as they are retaining in the, in the job. And we are working with the companies and now they are asking us that we continue with this training that we, co we have a combination of um, 100 hours of technical programs and 60 hours of soft skills programs. So we have th that's a very good combination because sometimes what they say the most important is the soft skills because the technical you will learn in the, in the job. So what they have um, uh, result of our work is that we have been working, like trying to um, involve the people with the compromise, with uh, 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 sacrifice of, of, of leaving the kids, of organizing themselves, because some of them are uh, households that live by themselves with children. So we have to organize the social environment because it changes dramatically. They have to leave the children in nursery schools. Uh, they have to adapt, um, to change the familiar uh, in the, the role of the family with with all with this uh, formal job. So all, going from the informality to formal really changed the the family lives. Thank you very much. And um, another important point is that most of them, 50 percent, are in the 20 to 30 years old. So it's young people, mm -hmm. mothers, um, women, Afro descendants. This is very important. Thank you very much. Um, Coming back to you, uh, Fernando, we've talked about the alignment of the different um, actors. H how much could you shape um, the, the, the program? Um, how much have you been involved in, in, in the setup? Uh, well, we did something that was a, a, an interesting learning experience, which was having a steering committee to implement the bond, because we needed it to be a success. Uh, I mean, we have put in more hours of work, so uh, our profits have probably gone down. And if you measure it, it's it, it's not going to do the. I mean, make it. But we learned, and we did with a with the investment team and with Corona as an as a head of the operations. Uh, we started to come up with different ideas to uh, do different, make different incentives for the for the uh, operators, mm -hmm. so they could reach their goals. Mm -hmm. So we had to uh, sacrifice uh, profits, but we needed to uh, make it to prove, a, to prove a point. So we were very, actually very flexible with the whole team, as, as uh, Christine was saying. We had a, a, a great team to come up with the proper tools and, and initiatives, and we uh, brainstormed a lot to see how we could uh, make the proper incentives to support the bond to make it successful. So, so it was a, it was a, 
a very interesting uh, learning experience to promote since the beginning of the of the of the bond a uh, periodical meetings they were like every 15 days and we, every two weeks that we we met with the whole team and we saw how everything was going and and we really made a uh, uh, follow up on, on on all the different issues and well i think we're we're making it can you mention one incentive that you you you're saying, yeah, here we really aligned, we could change it or, or make it clearer that everyone is. So, some of the, the service providers and the, and one of the things that we learned was that the service providers were not as good as they thought they were. <laughs> Which is interesting because they, they say we provide the service for the government and we do a, well, a good job because we get paid. Mm -hmm. But when, when the outcome was actually uh, shown mm -hmm. and they didn't mm -hmm. get to it, they didn't uh, make the point. So, so there we said, well, what, what can we do? Mm -hmm. We can give them an extra amount of money so they reach their goals mm -hmm. and they give them an extra amount of time. We op reopen some, some of, the, of, the, of the initiatives so they could get more people in, into the, into the uh, funnel. And uh, obviously we had to sacrifice our, our, our profits. But we needed to do that in order to, to make the, the, the bond, mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the SIP successful. So that, that was the kind of things that we did. And we also went to the, to the service providers and gave them the feedback so they could improve. I think that's very key, exactly, that this, this feedback loops among all the stakeholders is taking place. And it, it was and is truly a team And everyone was open-minded to understand and mm -hmm. to improve. So it was, a, it was a, not a negotiation, but more of a, mm -hmm. let's see how we can make it happen. Thank you. I'd like to add something that we did and that we haven't done it before. We have like a family day after three months of being in job. So we get together people from different companies so we can have like some experiences in order to uh, make sure that they can remain in the job. And we didn't do that before be, because we haven't that um, uh, um, condition that we, we will receive the payment by results. So we have to start thinking of methodologies that can assure that the people continue working. Mm -hmm. So we, that, that family day, we have a meeting around, around family budgeting because they weren't used to have money during the month. So that they have money, they, ha they have to have the priorities to spend that money. Mm -hmm. They have to work and uh, to have uh, tools for working in them, the, to have tools for <coughs> management, the working place. They have to have support from the network. So we have to assure that we get the results. Thank you. I would like to come back to Avnish uh, on a technical question. Um, we have seen and heard transaction costs are, are high. Um, how, how can you ensure that at the end we still have this cost efficiency uh, to create scale finally in, in this market? Yeah, uh, so, so I think uh, we talk often times about transaction costs, but I think Toby's point is right. This has to be thought of differently, right? We are trying to engineer a, a culture shift, a mindset shift, but also a shift in practices. And I've noticed whenever we work with organizations for the first time or in context for the first time, you're really creating a lot of new things, right? So a lot of new templates have to be created. We have to examine uh, the legal environment of this particular place. So a lot of new processes are in place that I think over time, if you're persistently working in a country like Colombia and producing one, two, three social impact bonds, you'd hope that some of these things are already in place and you can actually reduce transaction costs. I think that's very much the hope in this program. So I think what, what Seiko has done and what uh, with IDB of thinking about this as a SIB program as opposed to a specific transaction is really sort of laying the, the pathway forward for how donors can actually facilitate the expansion of this practice. Um, on the other side, though, it's also useful to note that some of these extra costs are actually extremely important to have in development in general. Uh, when you're shifting the conversation from, uh, you know, let's just come to a quick agreement on our thoughts on what activities we need to produce, uh, to let's create high stakes for each organization on results, I've also noticed that the due diligence that goes into these conversations is extremely uh, different, right? So you spend a lot more time in analysis, a lot more time in very ground, sort of truth grounding conversations, right? You can no longer, as Fernando mentioned, 
just come up with a random, um, um, a very sort of ambitious target. You have to be quite realistic about it, and you have to be data-driven in these conversations. So I think a lot of that is actually really important, and we don't do it enough in international development, and it certainly drives the amount of time that's invest invested in all sides of the equation, but it hopefully driving us to learn how to do things more in a more rigorous way and in a better way as well, right? So that kind of cost, I think, is totally justified, and we should have more of it. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in structuring projects, even when they're traditionally financed. Uh, so I think that, that that's the kind of cost that we want to see more of and that we t totally feel comfortable standing by and saying this is like really important. And then uh, the other types of costs, hopefully we have more and more donors pulling the capital together, building this outcomes fund, as Toby mentioned before, of you know creating markets, creating regulations that actually work. Sometimes I think every time we do this transaction, we feel we're swimming counter current, right? Because the systems are not really meant to pay for outcomes. So you're having to fight the, the way contracts are written, you're having to uh, educate lawyers, you're having to have a lot of conversations that if you had started this whole practice with paying for outcomes as uh, an objective, you would have set up your institutions differently, you'd have set up your technical capabilities differently. So I think there's a little bit of a capacity building process that donors also have to think about when they support these transactions. And I think that has been happening in this case and hopefully we're gonna see more of that in the future to help reduce the transaction costs. Thank you. That's certainly a conversation to be continued and we will have actually a breakout session in the afternoon on transaction costs, so we will certainly uh, be able to deepen that conversation. Um, you mentioned, Avnish, the, that, that this is really a program, it's not just transaction oriented, but it has a component two and three, as we, as we saw, about creating the market. Um, Christine, how do you see this, this knowledge building and, and market creation to bring in actually more service providers, more investors? Um, how, how, how do you foresee to go about that? Thank you, Liliana. I think that um, hearing Toby uh, earlier on was very interesting because Zach already had, had, had brought this point to Colombia, which was let's not just do one transaction, as is the case in most of the other uh, countries that we're, we're working in Latin America. It's actually let's do three so that we can build a model and, and give feedback into that model. And then also let's talk about the market. How do you build it? Let's not just wait to see if there is a market, but let's actually proactively go out and build a market. Um, and finally, which is very uh, in tune with the first, is uh, how do we build the knowledge base uh, and the learning? And, and, and I think one of the, the most difficult things has been uh, is when you start out by saying that a social impact bond is not a bond. Um, you run into a problem with communications, right? I mean, so, um, <laughs> so. So I think that one of the things that we've tried to understand, and this is a very good audience because many people know what we're talking about, when, but when we talk in Colombia, people have not heard about this. So trying to be very communication oriented and narrative oriented has been quite important and we have a really good uh, communications team at the Fundación Corona who has helped us out with this. Um, I, I don't think that I think one of the most important issues that the MIF brings to this is that we help develop business, basically small and medium businesses, and we also uh, help bring business to development. I'm not sure if you understand the two points that I'm trying to make here. One is, let's try to um, open up space for more small and medium businesses to be able to participate in government procurement. The only way we can do that is by bringing investors that can upfront the money. Um, Many of our service providers would not have participated in this SIB if we had not had the investment up front. So how do you create a market by making things competitive? And, and how do you make things competitive is by letting more people get involved. Uh, we not only lower prices, which I think a lot of people are really interested in this efficiency issue. I, I'm a little bit concerned about efficiency. I think that the effectiveness of having jobs um, is, is also very important because we don't have anything to compare it against. If you compare it against what we already have, all we've done is training and we hope somebody gets a job. But with this, we're actually showing that we can get jobs for people who are very, very difficult to place. So I think the effectiveness issue is very important and the fact that the MIF can bring um, this market space and, and this building of a market space has been extremely important. Um, now bringing, in, new investors in um, is going to be tricky, right? Because as Fernando has said, 
there's a lot of upfront costs that have been included here. A lot of the, you know, it's it's a moving uh, target. It, it's not that one side of the 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 uh, puente. What do you call it? Puente? Bridge, bridge. The bridge and the other side of the bridge. It's it's actually really a very moving target. A lot of moving parts. A lot of people involved. Um, so. When you sit down and you see Daniel present this so very organized and so structured, you're, you're going, oh my God, did we really do that? I mean, it didn't seem to be that structured when we were going at it, right? So we today are, um, we sound a lot smarter than we are. You know, I think that we need to be really, really um, sincere here. Um, we're learning. We're very early on in the in the in the process, um, and I think one of the things that we would very much like from this meeting is for you all to um, demand from us rigor. It's not because we're a, a, an emerging country that we can do things with less rigor. Uh, you all need to demand that we have the same level of information, of evaluation, and of metrics uh, so that we can continue to have this happen and we can help other countries, not only in the emerging markets, but also in developed countries, understand how we do this a little bit better. Thank you, Christine. I would like to come to my last question before opening uh, to the public, because I'm sure there will be questions. Um, Juan Felipe, what is uh, your vision as a government representative for scaling up the current program? Okay, Liliana. So uh, from the beginning, we, we said, yes, we are committed with this. We, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's take the risk. Um, and uh, we want to, to, to learn about it and, and to scale it. Um, from the beginning, we said we are going to, to do not, not just one SIP, but three. Um, so. Uh, with this, we, we will uh, test different aspects and scale the SIP to other social initiatives within our agency. Um, in fact, we, we have already proposed to implement a second phase of the first mm -hmm. SIP. Um, and I, th I think this is really important uh, that the government, like a, a, a Colombian, a government like Colombian government said, not only yes, let's do it. That let's do this, but uh, let's do a second phase. Now, with the first one is still implementing now, and we we still don't have the the results. Now we have a, a really good a partial results, mm -hmm. but not the final. So so it's uh, important, and it, the, this demonstrates that uh, we have already achieved a, sh a shift in the agency's mindset. Um, and uh, the alignment between uh, the goals of our employ employability programs, mm -hmm. um, the traditional em em employability programs, uh, with this SIP methodolo methodology. And uh, this uh, is incredible because it, it happens less than a year be, uh, into the implementation of the first SIP. Um, and it shows that changing in the government uh, mindset to paying for outcomes, it's possible in the short term. Um, but unfortunately, um, time is not uh, on, on our side um, because uh, we are in the final months of this uh, government of President Santos. And uh, we have a legal and legal and procurement uh, restrictions uh, now because of that. Um, but one way to, to get around this, these challenges of, of the upcoming national election uh, is to work with the subnational level and uh, Cali, one of uh, the largest city. Of, of Colombia, from Maria Rosario is, um, has already expressed interest in doing the second uh, SIB. Um, and another way to ensure scale is to include these SIBs uh, as um, a part of a national social policy. And as I mentioned, and mentioned before, uh, we are working on, on this by including the SIBs in the next government uh, development, development plan. Mm. For the government to be able to scale SIPs, to scale SIPs, we need not only proof that the pay for outcome contracts work, but uh, that we have evaluation that allow us to demonstrate their effects. 
Um, the that's why the project is currently developing um, terms of reference for this evaluation. And uh, finally, the whole team uh, of the, the SIP team uh, has held high-level meetings with other government agencies at the national and sub-national levels. And as a result, there is a strong interest among other public organizations, such, uh, such as the uh, Ministry of Education of the Ministry of Labor. Uh, and this shows that there is interest uh, and is, um, that is pretty incredible given that the SIP once goes through the end of July, as, as I said before, and we, we don't have all the results uh, yet. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think it's very encouraging to hear that you actually have taken steps to ensure that this process uh, continues and hopefully the new government will be also committed to, to continue as also the results will be evaluated, will be shared and uh, it's really work, work in progress. Thank you all very much. I would like to open to the public. Are there any questions to our distinguished panelists? I think there is a microphone. Yes, please. That was quick. Good morning. My name is Mark Herkenrath. I'm the director of Alliance Sud, which is the Swiss Coalition of Development Organizations. I know that a lot of NGOs, including my own, are seen as very critical of the financialization of development cooperation, etc., um, which is not actually true. I totally agree with Toby that. Um, Impact bonds can be an excellent instrument. They're amazing, actually. But they're only successful under certain circumstances. Their success is conditional on various uh, context-related uh, things. Let's put it like that. Um, so when I see your first or second slide, Toby, that impact bonds are not bonds, but you can think of them as a better way of doing aid, then I get a bit upset. Because I think the risk is that in the political and the public discourse, bonds are seen as a replacement of, let's say, traditional aid. And the discourse will be, let's cut um, aid budgets because the private sector can do it. And they're even better. There is the silver bullet. So I would like to hear more, and that's really not just a rhetorical question, about the complementarity of, let's say, traditional development cooperation and the new financial instruments. Where does each instrument have its place and what are the potential synergies, not just the differences? Well, if I may quickly um, react on that, um, I think uh, throughout the presentations and uh, State Secretary Inaichin has also made it very clear that it's by no means uh, a replacement, but certain conditions have to be in, in, in place. And in addition, we will discuss today critical um, issues. So that's just uh, from, from the Swiss government's uh, perspective to, to make that point uh, very clear. Um, I don't know, Toby, do you want to quickly react? <laughs> yeah. And then we go to the SIP no, Colombia specific sorry. points, yes. Um, just to say I agree that was probably too broad. I tried to make the rest of the presentation clear where its limitations were and otherwise. Um, I do think that we're trying to make aid um, focused on the people who are receiving it and not the people who are providing the money. And that is an enormous challenge. And this is simply one of the tools in that toolbox. Yes, please. Uh, hi, Peter Vanderwall from Palladium and Stratagos. Um, one of the synergies that we're doing in the Utkrist Impact Bond is supporting the government of Rajasthan through institutional strengthening and TA to be able to become an outcome funder, so a, a dib into a SIB transition using more of the tra tra traditional grant-based mechanism. So the dib will be very strongly focused on meeting uh, targets relating to improving quality in private health facilities in maternity services and then more of the, if I can put it traditional sense, doing some of the broader work, which is, is very complimentary. So that's, a, sorry, sorry to interrupt and take your stage. Yeah. 
Yes, I see some questions in the back. Um, yes, please. This is uh, Daniel from the Impact Network from Foundations, and I'd like to take uh, your last point, uh, Liliana, regarding the uh, scalability. We heard from uh, Ted Eklas that in the UK there were no SIBs continuing after they have been tested. So I was wondering, how do you see the chances in Colombia that uh, your uh, first SIBs will continue after that, will be scaled? I think you basically answered this question, but um, I, I'm, I'm, let's say, quite confident that the fact that the Colombian government has been brought in from the beginning um, ensures a, a, a good possibility that this will be, this will continue. It's not just because of, of, of us, SECO, that this will continue. I mean, when we talk about ownership and sustainability, we're interested that the key players in the country take it on. And you have shown the leadership. We, we're like facilitators, the, the, the IDB group and, and SECO. But I do believe you have planted the seed and that there are good chances that it will continue. I would, I would also like to complement that, that some government agencies, once we're talking about scalability, they think as the bond as a tool to improve their policies, not only as a financing model of bringing impact investors and, and transmitting the risk to the private sector. So when we're talking about receipts and employability, and the government says that, okay, with those three receipts that there are commitment, they will learn good enough to build their policies in a more practical way and not the theory of the policies that they are already launching. So that's also a different kind of scale that we think from the Colombia government so far. And I would add that um, obviously when you take into account that it's 514 people being employed out of millions, well, it's very, very small. And it probably it's probably going to take 10 or more years to get up to maybe 50,000, 100,000. And that is obviously, when you talk about 100,000 and you multiply it by the amount of investment, then we're gonna have a huge gap between who's, who's willing to invest and what's gonna happen. So I'm, I'm also kind of skeptical in how large can this be. But if you go back to, if it's only 1% of government spending, then you have a pretty big share. This is gonna be a niche market. And hopefully, uh, I mean, if it's if it's successful enough, and the profitability is good enough, I mean, a lot of people are going to be interested. But it's going to be always it's going to be probably a s small amounts. Thank you. We have one more question in the back. Yeah, my name is Amel, and we are designing now, trying to design the first scale-up outcome payment fund for education. We're looking at $1 billion outcome payment fund for education for Africa and Middle East. So watch our dust, because either we're going to be super successful or we're going to be laying in the dust. So let's see. <laughs> um, but my question is for the Colombian government part is, because I've been in government myself, and sometimes I feel like, we say pay for outcome is much more effective than pay for service. But sometimes, as you said, you pay for service, you pay $20, $50, $500 for training because politically you have to do certain things for certain areas in the country and you have to show you're doing something. But if they're getting employed or not, you don't know. But you know that for them to be employed, it needs you know, child care for single women, it needs maybe health issues, it needs coaching them on the job, it needs so much more that basically you are not gonna spend $50 pay for service that may not get them employed, but maybe $5,000, but then you'll have a person continuously employed. So it's, it's also a different budget that we may be talking about. So did you have that conversation? And in reality, are you now paying for these outcomes to have someone employed much more than you were paying for service when you were just paying for training? Well, uh, yeah, we, we have discussed this uh, within the, the, the team. Uh, it's, it's something we know. It's not it's not easy for us as a government to um, show results um, in this um, model in the short uh, term. Uh, like we may do with the traditional approach in uh, the training uh, uh, model. No? It's, it's, it's easy to say we are training 
thousands of persons, then we are um, getting job for just 500. Now, it's not in the political way. It's not. It's not uh, really good for us. Uh, but uh, in the medium term, uh, is 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 better. Is better. Is is to show the the impact, the real impact. I think is it would be better for the government. No, so because sometimes people realize that yes government is training us but we are not getting the job so no <laughs> sometimes they they realize about that but uh, in the political uh, terms is not easy for us uh, about the cost of uh, uh, what you mentioned well we know is not uh, the same cost probably is uh, higher um to um through this this model of this the SIB, um, we we don't have this really really clear right now how 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 higher is uh, how much higher is uh, we know it's higher but we know we are getting results in what we want to do so it's better for us. And I would say politically, it's it's quite attractive for a government to show results on jobs. We, yes, I think we can a, another point yes. is that for the companies has been very important because they have found that with this vulnerable community, if they are trained, they will receive a, 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 a people with more qualifications and the turnover will diminish. So you will see it in different sides, the companies, the foundation as operation in, in the vulnerable communities and the government. I think one more. Um, I think in the back was, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Claude Begley, Swiss Parliament. About the scalability, did you notice any difference in first tier city like Bogota and second tier city like Pereira? And do you consider to extend the scheme to rural areas, for example, to the zones which were affected by the FARG or the ELN? in order to reach the population which really have an employment problem. Well, it's an interesting question. From the beginning of the program, we set up that this Workforce for Development C program will be at the urban level, not the rural level, because we believe that the unemployability or the skill gaps in the market of employability is more within the cities, it's more developed, and it will be easily to close. From the displaced people of Colombia, over the 7 million, almost 6 million are still living in the cities. So there is also a huge opportunity to make some impact there. And when we're comparing the tiers of, of, of those kind of cities, of course, there is a different scalability. With Bogota, we achieve a, in a faster period the, 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 the first results of employability and we're in the retention process. With Pereira, because it's a smaller city, we have to work closer with the partnership and, and, and the scale was less, less people, less population, but it was more difficult. And we realized that not only through this project, but also start analyzing all the data and administrative data of previous projects on unemployability within those regions to see how much has been achieved with different kind of service providers. So there's an scalability issue, but you have to, to realize that uh, in Cali, for example, that now we're trying to develop the second social impact bond, we're trying to go to direct neighborhoods where the most vulnerable people is. So the scalable has to be like within those cities where to focus and where are the people, where are the companies how to be to close those skill gaps within them. In fact, we, we have uh, different programs uh, for rural uh, employment, employment programs for rural areas areas and from for uh, urban areas so this uh, model is is been tested tested in uh, urban areas with the, the uh, comparing with the job or employability program we have for these areas but uh, for the rural rural areas the approach must be different and in fact we are we have different programs and we have uh, different challenges uh, especially now with uh, the results of the peace process that that, that we have
I would like to thank everyone uh, for your active participation. To my panelists, a big thank you. And we will have coffee break, I believe, so you can continue conversation um, with everyone here present. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much to our panelists. Next, we have coffee. If I could just have your attention for another 30 seconds. We have breakout groups after the coffee break. And each of the breakout groups has a reporter whose job is to report back to the plenary what was agreed or the particular insights from your group. So that's Maya, Caroline, Molina and Radana respectively. Please could you support your reporter by five minutes before the end of your breakout group just having a wrap up of what you've agreed so we don't have a blow by blow account of everything that was said but just the, the real insights and exciting um, new pieces of information and evidence that have come out.